Good afternoon. I'm Sarah Gomes with Job Service Kalispell. Thank you for joining us this February to attend Blueprint for Business Success's second seminar in our 2021 Spring Series. It's my pleasure to extend a special welcome to all SHRM members attending today and thank the Flathead Valley SHRM chapter for this partnership and opportunity to offer free CEU credits to members. Please take a moment to help us identify the businesses benefiting from today's seminar by entering your name, title, business you represent, and your city in the chat box. SHRM members, please indicate your membership by including SHRM when signing in. The continuing education credit number will be given at the end of the seminar and will stay up on the last slide. Attendees are muted, but we encourage you to use the chat box for asking questions, which will be answered at the end of the presentation. Of course, we ask that you please be polite and respectful to all attendees and the presenter. The two minute anonymous survey when you leave the seminar helps us improve this program and provide meaningful topics and content. Today, we have the privilege of hearing from Andrea Hardin as she presents on the topic of creating and retaining a diverse workforce. Andrea is the trainer and targeted equitable relief coordinator for the Montana Human Rights Bureau. She brings a wealth of professionalism and insight in the field of human resources. Prior to taking on this newly created role, she investigated and mediated cases of discrimination in employment, governmental services, public accommodations, housing, and other protected areas of Montana law. Andrea received her Juris Doctor from the University of Denver and her undergraduate degree in international business from San Diego State University. Here is Andrea Hardin. Hello everyone and thank you so much Sarah for that very kind and gracious introduction. I'm very pleased to be speaking with you all today on the topic of creating and retaining a diverse workforce. And so there are four areas that we're going to go, go over and cover today during this training. And they are to briefly review what the Human Rights Bureau does and its processes in investigating a complaint of discrimination. We're then next going to define diversity and examine its value in the workplace. And then in step three, we're going to learn some of the steps that can be taken to improve the opportunity for diversity in the workforce. And lastly, we're going to go over um, how to better understand how to retain a diverse workforce once you achieve it. But first, a disclaimer. So just as a reminder, the Human Rights Bureau serves as a neutral. We're not telling people that call us what they should do in certain circumstances. Instead, we try to get them good information to let them know what we're looking at for guidance on our discrimination complaints. So just so you understand, the information provided in this presentation may contain legal information. Legal information is not the same as legal advice, which is the application of law to an individual specific circumstances. But at the Bureau, we do our best to provide neutral information that is accurate and useful, but we always recommend you consult a lawyer if you want professional assurance that our information and your interpretation of it is appropriate to your particular situation. And so first, the Human Rights Bureau is the state agency charged with enforcement of the Montana Human Rights Act and the Governmental Code of Fair Practices. Through a contract with the federal government, the Bureau also processes employment discrimination claims filed under Title VII of the Civil Rights Act of 1964, the Americans with Disabilities Act, and the Age Discrimination and Employment Act. The Bureau is the very first step in a multi-level administrative process that handles complaints of discrimination. We are the exclusive remedy, so that means that someone who is considering suing for discrimination must exhaust the administrative process before a court will hear their case. The Bureau's main function is to conduct informal and neutral investigations into complaints of discrimination. But it's important to understand that the Bureau does not get to turn away a complaint that's filed with us. We're obligated by statute to conduct an investigation. And the Bureau receives complaints in three different ways. The first way is through an intake process. Our intake process is an hour long telephone appointment with an investigator to discuss whether or not a caller situation falls within the laws enforced by the Bureau. If during that call, the investigator identifies that the information given by the caller does fall within our authority, then the investigator will draft a complaint on behalf of the caller. 
And so that's the first way that we receive complaints. The second way that the Bureau receives complaints is through self-drafted complaints. So somebody is uh, perfectly able to just go ahead and write up their own complaint, they can submit that for filing. And then of course, the last way that we receive complaints is when um, a charging party is represented by an attorney and then the attorney drafts their complaints and files it on their behalf. The Human Rights Bureau also provides confidential mediation services. Participating in the mediation that the Bureau provides is completely voluntary and it's free for when parties have a, a case pending in front of the Bureau. And parties that consent to enter into mediation, they're not obligated to reach a settlement. If the parties are unable to reach a voluntary resolution during mediation, the case simply returns to the investigator that it was initially assigned to in order to complete the investigatory process. So there's really um, no losing in the situation. Um, and, it's, and it's free, as I said. So it's a really great service that the Bureau offers. And lastly, the Human Rights Bureau offers education to the public. Uh, we, we try and reach out to employers and employees, um, students, tenants, housing providers, and other interested parties throughout the state. And we do this as a preventative effort to further awareness of non-discrimination laws. And just as a reminder, again, I'll, I'll state that the Bureau is a neutral entity. Um, we do not represent charging parties that file complaints with our Bureau, and we do not defend respondents that are named in the complaints that are filed at the Bureau. Instead, the Bureau's fidelity is to the law it is charged to enforce. And I wanna mention very briefly that the Human Rights Bureau only has authority to investigate complaints of discrimination and retaliation if those complaints fall within certain protected areas and protected classes. So this slide here shows you both of those. And, and so protected areas include employment, housing, education, public accommodations, credit and finance, and state and local governmental agencies. And uh, just for reference, 85% of the cases filed at the Bureau for fiscal year 2020 were in the area of employment. So they make up the bulk of our area of, of discrimination cases. The protected classes in Montana are also listed here, their age, sex, and of course sex includes pregnancy, sexual orientation, and gender identity. Um, also race, color, religion, creed, disability, national origin, marital status, political belief in the area of governmental services or government employment, and familial status in the area of housing. And so if you'd like to know more about any of these protected classes or areas, please feel free to, to ask during this presentation, or you can visit our website at www.montanadiscrimination.com also. And so for just a moment, I want to touch back on the way in which the Bureau enforces and investigates certain federal laws specifically. Um, as I mentioned, we have a contract with the federal government. It's a contract with the EEOC, and we investigate complaints of discrimination in the area of employment where the employer has at least 15 employees or 20 in the case of age discrimination. Um, under the dual filing with the EEOC. And this requires the Bureau to apply not only the Montana Human Rights Act and potentially the Governmental Code of Fair Practices, um, but when analyzing these cases, we uh, apply the federal anti-discrimination laws for employment cases as well. So for the most part, especially in employment discrimination, Montana law parallels federal law. And so now that uh, you have a basic understanding of the Montana Human Rights Bureau and by extension um, discrimination and the, the laws that we enforce, we're gonna move on to our next topic on the agenda, diversity. And so in addressing the creation and retention of a diverse workforce, the first thing we need to address really is what is diversity? The Merriam-Webster definition is the condition of having or being composed of differing elements. And so in my research, um, on this topic, I came across an interesting benchmark study. Um, the name of it was Best Practices in Achieving Workforce Diversity. And it was done in collaboration by the US Department of Commerce and the former Vice President Al Gore's National Partnership for Reinventing Government. And for short, uh, of course, on this slide, we're calling that the NPR. So this report um, that was, uh, you know, the collaboration of this study acknowledged that, and this is a quote, one of the major stumbling blocks in discussions surrounding diversity is its very definition, end quote. 
The study also acknowledged that diversity is often viewed as applying to race, ethnicity, or gender differences and linked to the laws providing protected status to certain groups, um, those protected classes that I mentioned in the previous slide. However, this study took a decidedly different approach to defining diversity, which is all characteristics and experiences that define each of us as individuals. And so like the NPR definition, I think a broad approach to defining diversity is best and includes accepting and respecting differences. Diversity in the workplace, workplace means that an employer employs people from a range of different protected classes, experiences, and backgrounds throughout its organization. So the next point to understand when considering a diverse workforce is why is diversity important? Well, first off, there's a belief that a lack of diversity stymies innovation. People from various social and cultural backgrounds bring with them a variety of new ideas, knowledge, and approaches. And this fosters more creativity and innovation as individuals are challenged to question their own perspectives and step outside their respective comfort zones. There's also the consideration of the work climate or productivity. It's said that a diverse workplace can indicate an environment of mutual respect. An inclusive work environment makes for a more comfortable and welcoming workplace for a broader spectrum of employees. And so this naturally increases team morale is the idea. And of course, happier employees make for more productive employees. And this element can also improve employee turnover rates because people will want to work in an environment and stay there that is accepting of all backgrounds. And of course, we all know that productivity and low turnover is good for the bottom line. And so customer service, as seen on this slide, that's usually of utmost importance to most businesses. And having a diverse workforce can really give a business better insight into its customers, especially considering that a lot of times employees can be past or even current customers of a business that it works for. If you only employ people from a certain demographic, you could be inadvertently alienating an entire customer base. And so as an exaggerated example of this, um, think of the restaurant chain Hooters. Hooters is not known for, a, for hiring a diverse wait staff. They have a definite target of the type of waitresses they hire. And think about it, do, do you think that that impacts whether or not some people choose to dine there? Of course it does, but based on their business model, they, they probably really don't care about that. But as I said, that's a very exaggerated type of example that I'm giving you, hopefully to help you just really think about this point. But generally, people tend to gravitate towards things that are like them as well. And so if a customer walks into a store and there's no one there that they perceive to be like them, they may not be as uh, comfortable or inclined to stay or continue on as a customer. And so a business with employees who can relate to the customer base tend to offer better customer service as well. And so with all of these benefits and a workforce that represents its community, an employer's reputation can also flourish. Um, ultimately, it's important to remember that as an employer, you want to hire qualified, competent, and productive employees. And the idea is if you limit your selection of employees based on assumptions about an applicant's protected class, you may be missing out on a sea of qualified, competent, and productive applicants. And so I've included this slide here. It's really just a hodgepodge of a bunch of different um, graphs and, and pie charts and tables just to kind of demonstrate and show you uh, what diversity in Montana looks like. And this is data that I gleaned from um, a state website and it's escaping me right now exactly, but it's uh, the most recent data that the state had that is from 2019. And at that point in time, we had a total population of 1,068,778 people. And so as you can see under the sex pie chart there, um, there was only about an 8,000 person difference in the actual numbers uh, for male versus female. So percentage wise, it really comes up to a 50-50 split on um, the category of sex. And in terms of race, our state is largely white. Our largest minority group is made up of almost 80,000 Native Americans or American Indian slash Alaska Native as coined in the demographics here. And that equates to approximately 7% of our state's population. Next, uh, the Black or African-American group and Asian 
and Pacific Islander group combined make up 2% of our state's population. And other categories that some may feel are missing from this are Middle Easterners and Latinos or Hispanics. So um, those categories are not considered races, but rather classified under national origin, especially since these categories are considered white. Um, so these people make up the 91% white population in Montana. The state data I accessed to get this most recent info didn't have any numbers for Middle Easterners in Montana, though I know they do exist, I, I've met them. Um, but the data shows that out of the entire population in Montana, 4% are of Hispanic or Latino uh, origin. And so then moving on to the age table, we see here that our state has an aging population with the lowest population consisting of the 18 to 24 age group and the largest being those who are age 65 and older. And not seen here, but according to the CDC, nearly 27% of Montana's uh, Montanans, excuse me, they experience some form of disability as well. So that's not seen in the graphic, but I, I wanted to uh, give you that, uh, that, that tidbit as well, that statistic. Um, so over a quarter of, of our state uh, could be people that, that qualify under the law as, as a person with a disability. And so there are many other factors that aren't included here or in demographic surveys that could also qualify someone as an individual who brings diversity to a workforce. And you should always keep that in mind. However, these are some of the big ones that our society typically focuses on. So I show them to you so that you can understand that what diversity in our state looks like will not necessarily be the same as a lot of other states throughout the country. And so now that we've talked about what diversity is and why it can be beneficial, let's talk about a few ways that employers can potentially increase the diversity of its workforce. So the first step is education. Education includes learning about your surrounding community and learning the applicable laws. I've had trainings that suggest employers should assess their organization's current diversity by looking around and taking stock. And while there may be some benefit to that, uh, employers really should be careful with that and, and be mindful that, as mentioned previously, not all diversity is visible. Um, you have examples such as religious beliefs or sexual orientation or even mental health issues. Um, there are a multitude of diverse attributes an applicant may have um, or even a current employee that is not seen with the naked eye or may not have been shared with others because not everyone discusses their religious beliefs or, or discloses a disability or a sexual orientation. So be careful about asking current employees about what protected classes they may belong to as well because that could get you in the hot water down the road too. So in the previous slide, we went over some of the demographics in our state. And I wanted to show you that so that you have a broad understanding of the realities of what diversity looks like in Montana. However, you should also learn more specifically about what diversity in your particular county or city or community looks like. What is suggested is that you get to know the community around you to identify candidate pools that you can pull from. There may be previously unrecognized applicant pools that can be tapped into from doing this research and learning more about your community. Things that you may want to look into are whether there are charitable organizations or advocacy groups that are associated with certain groups that can be an asset to you. Uh, the first one that pops into my mind is Disability Rights Montana. Now, I don't know what type of offerings they have, if, if this would be, um, you know, something that I don't know, like if they have a job board or anything like that, but, but you know, just trying to, to learn more about what type of groups are out there uh, that you may be able to reach out to. You never know what kind of resource you can find. Um, I also know that there is a Montana nonprofit association that lists its members on its website. I've visited it. It has um, some really cool like drop down menus to where you can look for nonprofits based on what kind of business they're into. Um, so that could be a tool to look at to identify different outlets available to you as well. Um, looking at the student organizations at your local schools or colleges or universities that could provide a means to access um, and recruitment of candidates as well. And so I've seen that there are ABLE chapters and, and for those of you who may not be familiar, ABLE is American Indigenous Business Leaders. Um, I've seen that there are chapters in Ronan High School, um, Hart Butte High School and Blackfeet Community Colleges, just as an example. 
So since diversity considerations in hiring often include characteristics that fall under a protected class, we also suggest that you make sure you understand the state and federal laws that govern anti-discriminatory hiring practices. Um, so that's our, our second point here on education. A uh, failure to hire based on a protected class can be a valid complaint of discrimination. So you'll want to make sure that you're not excluding someone because of their protected class or because they do not fall into a certain category within a protected class that you're seeking for the sake of diversity. And so I want to stress again that hiring a diverse workforce should not be a concerted effort really to target certain characteristics. Rather, it should happen naturally when you widen the breadth of your search for qualified candidates to previously untapped resources. And so after you've educated yourself on the law and the makeup of your community, the next step is to reassess your hiring practices. The first point asks you to consider the content of your job postings here on this, this slide. So consider putting in language that sincerely expresses a desire for diversity in the workplace. I would not suggest just using, we are an EEO employer because no one really knows what that means most of the time. Um, my bureau chief mentioned recently seeing a posting that said, our employees are like our toppings. They're all different, but come together to make the ultimate pizza. And so that could be worded even stronger, but still it puts the idea of diversity out there. Also, when you put together an advertisement, don't assume that the language uh, will be understood by everyone. I think you really have to have someone objectively review your posting to make sure it's both accessible and interesting. Um, and the more people you can have review the posting, the better, getting, once again, all of those different perspectives, um, the, the more the merrier, as they say. And so another example I came across um, was from a company called Slack, and they have online job postings. And, and their um, blurb that they put at the bottom is, Slack is an equal opportunity employer and participant in the US federal E-Verify program. Women, minorities, individuals with disabilities and protected veterans are encouraged to apply. Ensuring a diverse and inclusive workplace where we learn from each other is core to Slack's values. We welcome people of different backgrounds, experiences, abilities, and perspectives. We are an equal opportunity employer and a pleasant and supportive place to work. So um, that's very descriptive and, and uh, really gives you the idea of the values and importance that Slack places on diversity and respectful work environments. And so the point of assessing the content of your job posting, you may also want to review the qualifications for the job vacancy and consider if each qualification listed is truly essential. Um, studies show that unlike men, women are less likely to apply for a job when they don't 100% meet the qualifications listed in a job posting. Lowering the barriers, of course, doesn't mean that you have to hire someone who's less qualified than you desire, just that you will likely get a larger pool of diverse applicants. Um, similarly, words also send out a message if you use certain words within, within the content of the job posting. So words such as aggressive or competitive, those could imply to some female applicants that they won't belong in your organization if they don't consider themselves to have those um, qualities, those that are you know, stereotypically male qualities. And so when looking at your hiring practices, it's also valuable to review how you're advertising your vacant positions, which is the second point listed here on our screen. In seeking diversity, your goal should be to cast a wider net where you advertise the vacancy. Um, you wanna fill your recruitment pipeline with more diverse candidates. And so therefore you're gonna to have to cast that wider net. So rather than just sticking to your traditional channels, you'll wanna consider advertising your posting in places that you have not posted in before. And so remember this kind of harkens back to knowing your community and its makeup because that will really help you identify those untapped resources. So for instance, are there charity or advocacy groups with job boards in your area that can help you get your posting out to more people? Um, does your local high school or college have recruitment centers or events or even student organizations that cater to certain groups where you can promote your business as a possible employment opportunity to group members? 
And so moving on, the next one is blind hiring. Uh, you'll want to consider conducting a review of applicants blindly. And so this can be having someone outside of the hiring committee remove personal information that can lead to unconscious bias or telltale signs of an applicant's diversity or membership in a protected class. And this would include things like names that imply a gender, um, dates of birth, or even the number of years of experience that could indicate an applicant's age. So studies show that as human beings, we have a tendency to really gravitate towards people we relate to. This is known as an affinity bias, and it's just human nature. So if information that we typically use to make judgment calls regarding whether someone is like us can be removed from the equation, the less the affinity bias comes into play. There are also software programs available that will anonymize resumes for review. So we really suggest that as much as an employer can make the application process anonymous and simply focus on merit and qualifications, the better. And so next is um, the hiring committee or, or hiring panel. Making sure that your hiring committee has a broad and diverse background will also help bring varied opinions about applicants to the table. If you can have a diverse hiring panel reviewing applications and conducting interviews, the idea is that any affinity biases one person has, has a better chance of possibly being countered by someone with a different take or perspective on the qualifications of a candidate. Um, next, having interviewers stick to a script helps remove unfair bias by only asking questions that are relevant and appropriate. Asking the same questions for every candidate also ensures that the candidates are being evaluated by the same objectives. Also consider asking questions of applicants to gauge their value of diversity and acceptance of others' differences in the workplace. Uh, such questions could sound something like, um, as a company, we have strict non-discrimination policies. Would you be able to commit to maintaining a harassment-free environment, as an example? And similarly, when you conduct the reference checks, you should consider asking the references whether the applicant, or whether, excuse me, whether the person you're contacting for a reference is aware of any act or omission by the applicant that would indicate that the applicant would not be able to uphold your company's strict policies on discrimination. And so um, here at the Bureau, a question like that would sound something like, the Montana Human Rights Bureau is charged with protecting Montana's civil rights. Is there anything you're aware of that would suggest that the applicant is not 100% on board with the mission of the Bureau? And lastly on this, uh, this slide, when you're reviewing your hiring practices, look for ways to solicit feedback. Consider sending your applicants online surveys to complete, um, providing you the information on their experiences that they went through at the different stages of the hiring process. And so the last step to consider in creating a diverse workforce is the retention component. So once you have diversity in the workplace, make sure that you're fostering an environment that makes people want to stick around. The heart of this really boils down to making sure that your workplace is respectful and inclusive of everyone. And the way that the Bureau sees this most often falling apart is through hostile work environment or harassment complaints, among other types of discrimination complaints as well. Um, so you'll hear me refer to discrimination and harassment a lot in this section, talking about how to retain a diverse workforce. And so first off, policies and procedures are the backbone to creating a respectful and inclusive environment. Not only can you create and implement policies specifically addressing a company's values regarding diversity, but you should make sure that your policies foster those values by including anti-discrimination policies and procedures in order to maintain a respectful environment. Employers should be really proactive about their policies pull out your diversity and discrimination policies. Make sure they say and convey what you feel is important and not just some stock language that you found on the internet. When it comes to policy, the importance of anti-discrimination has to be from the top down. Thoughtful policies can be the first step and cornerstone that sets the tone of your company's values and really they tell your employees what to expect. Um, next, having effective written policies and procedures in place should provide employers with guidance and a roadmap if there is an issue or a complaint filed. If you have a plan to address a complaint, you're simply going to know what to do if you get hit with a discrimination complaint. 
not only is it important to have policy on how you as an employer will respond to such a complaint, but make sure that you have a procedure for staff to complain about discrimination and harassment. Consider the reporting process and whether you want it to be anonymous or open door, uh, perhaps a hotline complaint procedure, and make sure your policies foster the reporting of discrimination. I know that some employers make this very formal and there are a lot of great reasons to do that, but more than anything, you really want it to be as easy as possible for employees to bring forward concerns. You need a procedure that allows you to address concerns promptly and effectively. And the sooner you know if there's a problem, the sooner you can fix it and move forward. Um, to this point, if possible, having a dedicated go-to person to deal with such complaints um, who is trained to conduct investigations into those complaints not only reinforces your company's policies, but it can also mean the difference between being found liable for harassment or not in an administrative hearing or court. And so if you're a smaller employer without the ability to have a dedicated staff member, um, consider maybe an outside resource specifically for that, that purpose because it's really that important. And finally, if an employee files a charge of discrimination against an employer, I can tell you that the Bureau will definitely ask for policies and procedures as a part of its investigation. And so while policies may help employers defend against any type of discrimination complaint, it is most important to understand that a component of a viable defense for harassment in particular is having quality policies and procedures in place to address harassment in the workplace. That's part of the law. That's an element of the defense. So I'll say that again, employers that have high quality policies and procedures in place to address harassment specifically um, are better off when it comes to defending against complaints of harassment. But really that applies to, to all discrimination complaints, um, even if it's not an element. They really can help support and, and buttress whatever defense it is you have in any type of discrimination complaint. Anti-discrimination and harassment policies are definitely important since they encompass legal mandates, as I just mentioned, but don't forget that you can also craft policies for a respectful and inclusive work environment, outlining expectations that if violated can result in possible disciplinary action. So for example, you may have a policy that outlines unlawful harassment as being unacceptable, but that only covers people within the protected classes that we went over earlier. So think about your employees who may not fall in a protected class. Do you really want an employee to be belittled or mocked um, because they are overweight perhaps, or because they're a veteran or any other number of things that, um, you know, it is just, it's just wrong and disrespectful, but maybe they don't fall under protected class. So remember to think outside of the box of legal liability to really focus on what type of work environment you wanna create when determining your policies. And as a practical point here on this slide, one thing to consider is a separate signature or acknowledgement specifically for your discrimination and respectful work environment policies that you have in place. Um, this, this, of course, um, I think a lot of times will sh help shield employers from liability, um, showing that, that they've put this out there and their, their employee has signed saying that they're aware of these policies. Um, so of course, that's a good point and reason for it. Um, but also think about what kind of impact it makes on your employees when you pull this one piece of paper out of the pile while they're onboarding and they are asked to read this one sheet and then sign acknowledging it. Um, think about what kind of impact it makes on your employee uh, when they see that same training or that same piece of paper as this, this example shows, this same piece of paper showing up every quarter, quarter or um, every six months or every year, uh, it really is going to try and emphasize there that this particular component is uh, has high value in the workplace. And so I'll just wrap up this slide by saying, if you have a discrimination or harassment policy in place, uh, today or tomorrow, take time to review it and consider the language. Do you understand it? Will your staff understand it? Does it convey your values as a company or agency? And if you don't have a policy, now is the time to put one together. Make sure that it sets the tone. Make sure it conveys the gravity of a violation reflecting your values and sensibilities. 
And if you make changes or make a new policy, make sure you disseminate this new policy to all your employees and direct them to review and encourage them to ask questions. And so now that you have your written policies and procedures in place with respect to diversity, discrimination, and respectful work environments, part of implementing those policies includes messaging your organization's values. Begin to permeate your workplace with the message that you value diversity. You're saying this in staff meetings, you're training on this, it's in sporadic email messages, it's in job postings. The trick is figuring out how to do this in a sincere manner that resonates with employees. In order to do this, you'll really need to think about how to dedicate resources to this topic. And of course that can be money, time or staffing. You need to set aside resources tasked with addressing the issue. But also keep in mind um, that the Bureau does have some resources for you. Uh, we have some uh, anti-discrimination posters and brochures um, if you're interested in making those a resource for your employees as well. And in the previous slide, I mentioned that the policies you have need to show a top-down commitment to retaining your diverse workforce. In order to message that policy and value, it's now time to make sure that the value is being modeled from the top down as well. So make sure that your supervisors are tuned in and active observers to ensuring a zero tolerance for discrimination and harassment in the workplace. Also make sure that management is acting respectfully during interactions with both external and internal contacts. And subordinates have to understand that these values are important to the company and aren't just words on a paper or talk at a staff meeting or training session that they have to go through each quarter. If the values are lived out by superior subordinates are more likely to buy in. So now you have your written policies in place that reflect your organization's values. Your management is modeling those values to your employees. You also need to make sure that educating your employees on your values is a priority. Your first opportunity for this, of course, is during a new hire orientation usually. Even if there's no formal orientation at your company, you should still consider providing at least an informal training to new employees on your policies and procedures so that they can be exposed to your values right off the bat. Um, offering an employee an opportunity to discuss and ask questions could be beneficial as well. And as mentioned earlier, dedicating resources is an important part of messaging, but it's also necessary in committing to regular and ongoing trainings for all staff. But doing so will keep your values and zero tolerance for discrimination and harassment top of mind in the workforce. It'll also give you the opportunity to inform your employees of what to do if they or a coworker are ever in a situation where they feel that they're being harassed or discriminated against by reminding them of who they can complain to and what the procedure will be, will be like for them if they do so. And so for example, if you provide refresher training to your employees on what happens if they report discrimination, and, and that includes reminding them that matters will be investigated promptly and confidences will be kept to the extent possible while conducting an investigation and that they won't be retaliated against for reporting. Your employees will not only realize you take this kind of issue seriously, they may be more likely to come forward if they need to. And you should really think about teaching your employees to stand up for each other and encouraging them to get involved. After you've trained your employees about unacceptable behavior in the workforce, train them on speaking up for each other. Consider an entire training on bystander training. So think about it. If you have an employee at ground zero telling another employee, hey, we don't use that language here. It really is in your best interest. And as mentioned before, we want employees to buy into this respectful and inclusive environment. They have to want it too. And so if they're not comfortable addressing it in the moment, make sure that they know that they can either talk to the employee that was harassed about uh, the behavior or um, that they can report it themselves and that they understand how to do that. So again, encourage employees to stand up for one another and to be involved. Uh, they need to know how to do this. And most importantly, they have to know that they won't be retaliated against for reporting. And so it's been the Bureau's experience that Montana employers think that their employees have the same values and sensibilities as they do. And I think that for the most part, this is true, but it's not always the case. So when you're training employees, give your employees parameters 
Don't be afraid to be specific and offer clear guidance. Studies have shown that employers need to be specific and provide clear guidance about what is and what is not acceptable. And so this isn't to suggest that you have to cover everything, but specificity gives employees an idea of what the parameters are. Again, it sets the tone. So this slide really gives you some examples of the difference between general and specific guidance to consider. And so general is don't harass people because of their race or you can get written up. Um, some examples of specifics is um, it's unacceptable to use racial slurs in the workplace. Don't ever use the N-word or any variation of the N-word. Don't ever mock Native American names or culture. Um, here at ABC Company, we have a clear anti-harassment policy, and if you violate this policy, there will be consequences up to and including termination. And so for this slide, I'm just going to focus a little bit on sex-based harassment um, for a moment. Clearly, recent developments in sexual harassment law have made it harder for employees to understand what is and what is not acceptable in the workplace. And so this means employers have a great opportunity, really. Um, employees want to hear from their employers on this topic. You, you have to be prepared to have difficult conversations. So the rule we play by at the Bureau is that you have to consider how a comment or perhaps touching is going to be perceived by the person on the receiving end. It isn't enough to simply say, I didn't intend for that comment or that hug to be taken as sexual. Tell your employees to step back and consider the impact um, and do they know how it will be received. This is particularly true when it comes to physical touching. Um, I tell employees to use caution because everyone has their personal space bubble and some people's space bubbles are bigger. So you really just need to honor the space bubble. And if you're not crystal clear on how a coworker will receive the comment or a touch, you definitely should be just erring on the side of caution. And just for a minute, um, going back to the changes in the law, there was a landmark US Supreme Court civil rights case uh, this past year that held that Title VII of the Civil Rights Act of 1964 protects employees against discrimination based on their sexual orientation or gender identity. So some guidance on training staff regarding these issues are noted on this slide. And it, can, uh, it includes, do not refer to a person's sexual orientation or gender identity in a disparaging manner. And no, it doesn't matter if you're just kidding around with coworkers, it will not be tolerated. Um, further, don't speculate or gossip about anybody's sex life, sexual orientation, or gender identity. It's just unacceptable. And finally, tell employees that if they work with or serve someone that is transgender and that person expresses a preferred pronoun, um, they should use the preferred pronoun or name. Um, I know this can be difficult and a slip up or a mistake isn't going to be the end all, but a repeated intentional misgendering or misnaming could potentially be considered unlawful harassment. And so as mentioned earlier in this presentation, um, be prepared to have difficult conversations. And as we all know, practice makes perfect. So this slide suggests that employers practice difficult conversations and gives you some examples of things that could happen in the workplace to help you think through how you would react to such situations. So take these points as practice examples. I'm, I'm not gonna go through them, um, but uh, you can take them as practice examples for yourself so that you're prepared, but also consider these points as possible training tools to share with your staff as a training opportunity, perhaps. I know everyone hates role playing, but consider the usefulness of possibly running through these scenarios to see how you or your staff will or should react in these difficult situations. And if you encounter conduct from your staff that may constitute harassment, such as the examples in the previous slide, some considerations and questions to ask yourself are, can I let this slide? Um, should I approach this in the moment? Or is it something that I can handle after the fact? Um, should I do this by email or in person? Do I need to follow up with the other staff members? Most importantly, the person impacted. Uh, should this be mentioned in a performance evaluation? And should I be talking to human resources about disciplinary action? Again, these are questions to think of in order to prepare yourself for difficult situations you can find yourself in as an employer. And hopefully, as we discussed earlier, you have some solid rock star written policies that guide you in answering these questions when confronting behavior that is discriminatory or harassing or just plain disrespectful. 
employers should have a plan and be prepared uh, for how, it, how they will enforce the policies they put in place regarding discrimination and retaliation. So typically this looks like a policy on discipline and termination. Employers have to be ready to follow such policies in the event they are faced with a violation of a policy, usually after an investigation. So following through with appropriate and proportional discipline for such violations will also send a message to employees what the company's values are regarding such actions. Of course, be mindful of Montana's privacy laws when deciding what to disclose to coworkers in such circumstances, but also be mindful that in such situations, there will likely be at least one or two people who are in the know or think they're in the know of what happened. And they, not, they may not be uh, quiet about it and they, they may not be bound by confidentiality. So word can get around about these types of situations. So be mindful of that. Um, I know that when I was investigating complaints in these types of situations, a lot of the time the charging party would express, um, you know, I went and complained about it and they did nothing about it. Sometimes that was the case that nothing was really done. And sometimes it was that, um, the employer just couldn't share what was done about it because of confidentiality. But in either case, uh, sometimes it really resulted in the charging party losing confidence in the process um, of reporting. So keep that in mind. Um, a tool to make enforcing anti-discrimination policies a priority is putting compliance with the policies in your employees' performance evaluations, or perhaps having compliance be a component of a job description. And if along the way, while following one of these policies, you experience a hiccup, use that as an opportunity to see how you may need to change things up to avoid that hiccup in the future. But don't just wait for these situations to assess your policies, practices, and compliance. Um, conducting some type of regular proactive review would be most beneficial, especially in light of changing laws. So for instance, I mentioned the US Supreme Court case that came down last summer. Does your anti-discrimination policy reflect the change that sex discrimination includes sexual orientation and gender identity? Um, these types of reviews are good for the company and good for remaining compliant with changing laws. Part of the assessment could also be conducting exit interviews for employees leaving the company in order to garner some valuable feedback to adequately assess your practices as well. And of course, ultimately these reviews would be fruitless if you did not take the information and make changes where inefficiencies or ineffectiveness have surfaced. So don't be fearful about having to address or evolve your organization um, policies as you learn more and encounter new territory. And of course, keep in mind that if you change policies or procedures, make sure you get that information to your employees in the form of either training and perhaps even a new signature acknowledging the changes. And so to wrap it up, just uh, wanna end with, remember a qualified, diverse workforce supported by respectful and inclusive work environment is good for business and good for your bottom line. This type of workforce encourages innovation, a positive attitude, productivity, retention, and great customer service. And so with that, thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate you uh, joining me here for this important conversation. And thank you, and I'll open it up for questions. Awesome. Huge thank you to Andrea for giving her time and sharing her ex expertise on this topic with us today. Following a few announcements, we will leave up Andrea's contact information in case you have any further questions for her or would like to request a copy of her slide presentation today. Now, the fun part, let's open it up for some Q&A. If anybody out there has some burning questions, feel free to enter them right in the chat box and we will answer all questions as time allows. So one that we've got right off the bat here, Andrea, is uh, since Montana has a population that is mostly white, how can an employer achieve diversity among its employees? Great question. Um, yeah, and that's definitely something that, that impacts that. Um, I think the first step is really to perhaps take a look at your definition of diversity. So diversity includes all the characteristics and experiences that define each of us as individuals. So achieving diversity in the workforce goes far beyond just the consideration of race alone. There are many aspects that you can't really see with the naked eye and, and they lend themselves to diversity as well. And so also, um, as I mentioned, one of the benefits to diversity is having employees that can relate to the variety of individuals that make up your customer base 
And so if your customer base comes from a community that's mostly white, but made up of people with different mental or physical disabilities, or perhaps veterans versus civilians, or even the different age groups, looking at that community first, doing that educational component, um, it's going to be your best gauge perhaps in the diversity that would be beneficial in your workforce um, as far as relating to your, your customer base. So you have the option of accepting the demographic realities of our state um, and embrace diversity offered by the current residents, or you can try to recruit employees from other states as well. But again, from a discrimination perspective, make sure you're hiring based on merit and qualification, because if you pass over a more qualified white applicant for what you deem a diversity uh, option, you may end up with a complaint filed against you at the Bureau because um, white people can be discriminated against based on race and uh, diversity is, is not a defense to that. Wonderful insight. Thank you so much for that response. Another question here is, I have heard a lot about microaggressions lately. How do those play into the work the Bureau is doing? Sure, yeah, I've, I've heard a lot um, about that term lately as well, but um, the term itself isn't really discussed at the Bureau. My understanding, and, and mainly from like the, the dictionary definition, um, would be that microaggression is a comment or even action that can subtly and often unconsciously or, or maybe even unintentionally express a prejudiced attitude towards someone who is a, a member of a marginalized group. And so with that definition in mind, what I can say is that I am certain that there are situations that the Bureau has investigated that would fall under that definition. But the fact that this situation is deemed a microaggression um, would not be the primary concern. Uh, the Bureau's uh, fidelity is to the laws that it enforces and currently the law does not prohibit microaggressions as such. So rather the Bureau investigates whether any comment or action would be considered harassing or discriminatory, and then analyzes whether those actions satis satisfy every element necessary to be considered harassment or discrimination, and then whether there are any viable defenses. On the other hand, um, considering you know, what we've just talked about in this presentation, comments or acts that could be considered microaggressions would likely not be very conducive to an inclusive working environment. So that is why training employees on specific things that are unacceptable is so important. As the definition suggests um, for microaggressions, often the comments or acts are done without the person even knowing uh, or realizing that they're being hurtful or prejudiced. So there needs to be that educational component um, that is straightforward and also that speaks back to the the specific versus general as well. All right, yeah, that sounds like you're saying there's a lot that can be done in-house about making sure that your, your culture behind the company really understands that behavior expectation. That, that does sound like it could be a tricky fine line there. Absolutely. Uh, another question we've got for you is, is there a type of diversity training that an employer can offer its employees? You know, I've Googled that and it seems like there's a whole bevy of, of options out there, um, but none specifically that I'm aware of that the Bureau would necessarily endorse. Um, and, and so I know there's some free trainings out there and I know there's some that, that you can um, pay for and have all different kinds of features um, to them. But um, it's it's interesting in, in uh a training that, that I recently went through on this topic as well. Uh, the, the presenter brought up um, a 2019 article about a Harvard business study that looked into the impacts of mandatory training um, on diversity that a lot of the Fortune 500 companies are requiring. And uh, it was interesting to note that some of the statistics suggested that the mandatory diversity training can cause a backlash or activate an employee's biases. Um, or perhaps even just that the effects really don't last beyond the initial training. So in essence, the information seems to suggest that uh, the mandatory trainings have a limited impact on employees' behavior. But there are statistics that suggest that getting your managers involved really helps. And that's why I stress during the presentation that these values have to be in policy and modeled from the top down. 
Um, there are also suggestions of random me mentorship type assignments being helpful. And that's meant to get people involved with and invested in a coworker that perhaps they wouldn't normally interact with. And um, when, when I read about that being uh, more effective, it really made me think back to the Mark Twain quote uh, that travel is fatal to prejudice, bigotry, and narrow-mindedness because to me, the idea behind that quote really is exposure and interaction. And so for outfits where mentorship may not make sense, I think some type of maybe team building exercises if possible, um, just looking for ways to get your employees around each other, to know each other as human beings, it can really be beneficial in this regard. Great insight that that really does kind of open some avenues on directions that employers can go with with offering that kind of training. And unfortunately, that is all the time that we have for questions today. Um, the Flathead Valley SHRM chapter thanks Job Service Kalispell for the opportunity to offer free CEU credits to members for Andrea Hardin's timely presentation on workplace diversity. Thanks again, Andrea. Now, a quick reminder for those who have not reported their attendance yet to enter your name, company name, job title, and city in the chat box. SHRM members, please remember to indicate SHRM. Next month in March, Blueprint will pause to focus on the Kalispell Safety Fest Montana 2021 and ABC clinics. Blueprint returns in April with wage and hour laws and independent contractor exemptions in Montana, presented by Logan Jackson from the Department of Labor and Industry, Employment Relations Division. As a reminder, there will be an anonymous two-minute survey that pops up when you leave today. Your participation will help us improve this program and provide meaningful topics and content. Thank you again for attending.